he really is one of the best, if not the most underrated when it comes to analyzing the college football game, how guys translate to the NFL. He also was covering the XFL. We'll ask him about his experience with that. And of course, the NFL offseason is still business as usual. The NFL isn't pushing back anything. Emery Hunt joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. Emery, how are you doing this Saturday? I'm doing fine, man. As always, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you jumping on. So I want to get you in first on the topic that we were just discussing for the first segment, myself and the listeners texting in, which is Malcolm Jenkins. The Eagles got to make a decision on this guy. You know, he says that he wants a new contract. Team option coming up. The league year is four days away. What would you do if you were running the Eagles? You know, it's it's interesting because when you look at his situation and, and what he's meant to the team, in, in a normal sense, you'll say, okay, sign him back. But if you trust your, your ability, ability to um, – find and evaluate talent, then you can always find talent to, to acquire. Or you can find someone young and up and coming to do it a lot cheaper. They did that when they acquired him initially from New Orleans and it worked out for him. I think they can do the same thing. So if you're looking at it from a business sense, you always want to say, hey, I could find younger, cheaper talent that's on the come up. But if you look at it from an emotional standpoint, you're like, man, we got to have him back. He's a good leader. So I can understand both sides of it. I will probably tend to go with the younger player because you want to be able to maximize not only your, your cap space, but also uh, maximize your chances in the draft. Because, again, you get younger, cheaper talent that's just as good or if not better to come into your roster. Okay, so that being said, then who would you try to go for in the free agent market? Because it's not a deep safety class, but there are safeties out there. So who is a guy... That again, if you are running the Eagles and you're saying, listen, we're moving on from Malcolm, like you just said, who are you then replacing him with? To me, it wouldn't even be free agency. It would be someone in the draft because I'm all about that younger, faster, quicker, explosive talent that I could bring in, mold, and, and put into my lineup. So I wouldn't even look at it from a free agency standpoint. I would look at it from a draft standpoint. So then that leads me to the next question. Who in the draft, because we know the Eagles are late first round, they have you know all those compensatory picks in the later rounds, the Eagles have a full cupboard of picks for the first time in a long time. So is there a safety or two that you look at in the draft and say, listen, man, if you pass up this guy, you're making a mistake? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that drastic. I would probably say, you know, it would be uh, Grant Delpit out of, LSU would be a good player to, to step in right away. He plays similarly to what we've seen from Malcolm Jenkins. So Grant Delpit out of LSU would be a, a guy, if you, if you guys are looking for a name, Delpit, I like how he plays out there at safety. Emery Hunt here on the Borough Conda Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. You know, Emery, there's a lot of moving parts going on with the NFL season. A lot of guys getting cut, a lot of guys getting franchise tagged. Of all the news that dropped yesterday, was there a, a guy released or a franchise tag that surprised you? No, not really. And, and to be honest, I haven't been keeping up with the, you know, with all that's going on. I haven't been keeping up with franchise tags and things like that. But nothing really surprised me at that point. I will say this. I am glad that the Bears were able to bring back uh, Danny Trevathan because I think that's a huge part to their to their defense. Plus, he's a, he's a really good player. And also, it saves them from attacking that position in the draft. So I thought that move was pretty significant for Chicago, especially if they're putting all their chips on the table for, let's say, uh, a quarterback that they're trying to focus on, maybe in free agency or in the draft. Getting your middle linebacker, your inside linebacker position solved with a really good player in Trevathan definitely you know, knocked out one major need going into uh, the draft. Speaking of the draft, I know that the NFL has announced that you know they're not going to have recruiting visits. A lot of the pro days are either being canceled or postponed. If players can't come in for workouts, and a lot of this stuff is done you know, over the phone or video call, the interviews, how do you think that's going to impact guys' evaluation processes for teams, and how could it impact guys moving up and down the draft boards? Well, it could impact because you're looking at a big part of those meetings are um, 
you know, it, it's, it's more about how guys feel about the coaching staff, the organization, all that good stuff like that. And, you know, if you don't have a good feel for the person, how they interact with one another in person, it could be a tough sell once you get them in the building and, they, and you realize, like, man, we probably could have passed on this guy because of X, Y, and Z. That's the downside that you, you run into. But the, the tape is a tape. So the on-field talent, I think, won't won't matter. It's just the fact that you don't know what you're getting from a personality standpoint. Because as we all know, if we're going through, going through the interview process before, you can – you can sell yourself pretty well over the phone or via, you know, teleconference or what have you, but you really can't hide who you are in person. And I think that element of not being able to have that, you know, uh, personal connection or that personal in-person meeting with the team and with the, the you know, the coaching staff or the organization, the, you know, the front office, that's going to make things very tough. Uh, as far as signing is concerned, because now you're going to rely on third-party information. The other thing that's interesting is that, like for example, with the Philadelphia Eagles, I know a big part of them drafting Carson Wentz was that the owner, the GM, the head coach all met with him, and they all were sold on him in the in the post combine process of evaluation. And I have to wonder, Emery, you know, for especially for some of the quarterbacks. Obviously not guys like Burrow, but you know the guys who are a little bit further down the board. You know whether it's a um, uh, Jordan Love from Utah State, you know whether it's a Justin Herbert from Oregon, or some of the other guys further further down the list. I, I'm just curious, you know, how teams not being able to meet with them that's going to affect their stock because of the fact that I know a lot of times coaches they want to have a hands on conversation with some of these guys in order to evaluate them for drafting. Yeah, and and that's the tough part because now you you wonder, okay, are we getting the right guy? Are we getting sold the bill of goods? And that's why you're really going to have to rely on the scouts that have been out there all year long. Sometimes, in certain cases, studying a prospect for two years on whether or not you know the information, the background information they got on the player's personality and his you know his makeup is going to be accurate. So they're going to rely heavily on scouts this particular period more so than I think than ever. Emery, speaking of the scouts, are there times, and again, this is obviously, you know, not, you know, a hundred percent one way or the other, but is there a possibility that sometimes scouts, you know, play favorites with some of these players and that could affect negatively or positively how some of these draft boards go? Cause we know that, you know, if you can't meet with the guy and you can't work him out yourself and you're depending on a scout and a scout may have a bias toward a player or a school or a conference, you know, could that also not influence positive and negative people's draft boards? Definitely, because you know how it is. It's harder to critique somebody that you really like, you know. And if you built a good relationship with someone, it's hard to really say, like, man, you know what? I, I would stay away from this guy because of X, Y, Z. Because you, you are now looking at it from an emotional standpoint, and it's hard to take emotion out of a lot of situations, and this is one of them. Speaking of emotion, let's flip it over. I know you did a lot of coverage of the XFL with your Twitter, with your YouTube channel. You know, you were all over it, and now it's been it's been stopped again for obviously very different reasons. This time, twenty years later, I just wanted to get from you initially. You know, what was your experience covering the XFL life? First of all. XFL was great, man. I thought it was outstanding. The access that you got as a media member was tremendous. You know, interview requests, uh, things that you wanted to do from a content standpoint, they gave you essentially car, car blanche and allowed you to do things that really gave the, the watcher, the viewer, the listener, the fan, a lot of insight into what's going on. And so I absolutely loved it. I, I just thought it was a great you know, opportunity for guys to get developed. Uh, you know, the NFL talks a lot about developing offensive linemen. Well, the XFL did a great job in doing that. You saw some teams that had tremendous offensive lines, uh, Tampa Bay and St. Louis being one. You saw a great tackle and Storm Norton uh, have a great season in the XFL. You saw other guys at quarterback develop. P.J. Walker was one right there out of Temple. Uh, you saw Jordan Ta'amu out of uh, Ole Miss who played for St. Louis. 
Cardell Jones started off great but didn't really finish well, but he was able to get some extended playing time. And so all of that experience, I think was beneficial, and I absolutely love what they did, and I'm glad they're coming back next season. Of the players who played this year, how many of them do you think get scooped up by the NFL? I'd say a good bit, man. Um, you know, and I think the uh, the more interesting question would be how many guys will get signed to significant contracts. So a lot of these guys probably would get you know offered uh, futures deals or you know tendered deals in that regard, but the real true test would be the, the true contract. So let's say, for instance, a guy like P.J. Walker, who should have been the MVP of the XFL, if they still award MVPs, right. he pro- he'll get it. So let's say if you're P.J. Walker and you're a team like Cincinnati or a team like the Dolphins that, okay, maybe we don't want to pay a rookie or a team like Tennessee that has a, a lot in place already, great run game, very good defense, and the style that you're transitioning from Tannehill to a P.J. Walker is about the same, it, he could save you a draft pick. And now you go into the draft from a different approach. Like, okay, we can get, we can sign cheaply this quarterback to be our starter. Now we can attack the draft and go get a premier position player to help us out immediately as opposed to drafting the rookie, hoping that he develops properly and, and all of those things that go along with it. So I think that'll be more interesting to watch. Who gets the significant contract, whether it's P.J. Walker, whether it's Cam Phillips, the receiver, for Houston, or whether it's a guy that, you know, like Sean Oakman or Anthony Johnson, who gets that premier contract coming from the XFL will be what to watch for. What about a guy like Raheem Moore? I felt like he played really well, you know, not just because of the interceptions, but I felt, I felt like he was a legitimate difference maker on that defense for many games. I think for him and other guys of that caliber, the age will play uh, a huge role. And I think that ship has sailed for those guys. So for me, it'll be important for those players to go back and provide some sustainability, some stability uh, to the XFL roster that they're on. So now you can go back into the 2020 season, 2021 season, and say, okay, but well, we have you know a pillar in uh, Raheem Moore returning. We have you know, this guy returning, so that way you know going in, okay, we have some foundation pieces in place, and then you can add with guys that don't sign with the NFL that were already on the roster and also add some rookies. One more for you, Emery. I appreciate your time here on 97.3 ESP. Again, folks, follow him on Twitter at FBall Game Plan. All your NFL draft coverage you need heading up to the end through the NFL draft. FBall Game Plan on Twitter. What is the one rule or rule tweak or element of the XFL that you expect the NFL to grab and use first? That's a great question. I would probably say the kickoff. I think that was outstanding. Everyone initially was like, you know what, I, I'm a traditionalist. I don't know. But after watching it, you're like, yo, this makes a lot of sense. And it gives you a little bit more creativity in how you are going to, you know, call plays or uh, attack the, the kickoff it adds more strategy to the kickoff return in my in my opinion. So I say that could be something that they could implement immediately. I also think with that, you know, Emery, real quick, I think it's also a great way to keep guys having jobs. You know, with some of the rule changes, it's made the kick returner and punt returner less relevant. Whereas if you take what the XFL does, it allows those guys to really have functioning jobs again on the football field, whereas a lot of times they're starting to get phased out in the NFL. Exactly. And so now you add a little bit more strategy to it, a little bit more element to it, and guys are going to take more pride into that that third aspect of the game that tends to get overlooked. Absolutely. He is Emery Hunt again. Follow him on Twitter. F-Ball Game Plan. He does a great job covering the NFL, the NFL draft. He was covering the XFL as well. Emery, always appreciate your time here on the show. Anytime, guys. Appreciate you having me on.